like forever. I can remember saying, oh gosh, I'm in hell. I mean, this is just the smoke and the flame. It was hot. I heard someone yell out, everybody out, I think it's gonna blow. They said we were going over 300 miles per hour. When the plane crashed, it, it was surreal. There was fire and debris. I saw people torn apart. It's like a war. Welcome to the second half hour of Friends at Five. I'm Alicia Niaves. Today marks a somber anniversary. It's been 25 years since the crash of U.S. Air Flight 1016. 37 people died on July 2nd, 1994, after the DC-9 commercial flight from Columbia crashed into a field in a home near the Charlotte Douglas Airport, the plane breaking into three pieces. 20 people miraculously survived the crash. Today we're hearing stories of survivors that hail from the Midlands. 25 years later, they're looking back on that fateful day. Hello, I'm Jason Sturkey and I'm a survivor of U.S. Air Flight 1016. In 1994, the Saturday before the July 4th holiday was a sunny day in Columbia. Lots of hustle and bustle at the airports. Families taking trips for the long weekend. At the last minute I decided to go and then somehow my nephew Christopher got on, on board as well. Jason Sturkey, a soon-to-be junior at the University of South Carolina, had a seat booked on U.S. Air Flight 1016, a 33-minute flight from Columbia to Charlotte. With him was his mother, Sue, and his nephew, Christopher, ready for a 4th of July family gathering in Memphis. Every year or two, one group would make the trip either direction. Either someone would come from Tennessee or um, someone would go from South Carolina uh, to go visit some of my mom's family in Tennessee. It was an evening flight, taking off from Columbia shortly after 6 o'clock. As passengers boarded the plane, some who were seated in the rear asked to move to the middle, including Sturkey's family. I remember we were right around the wing area. My mom was on the aisle seat, I was in the middle, and then my nephew Christopher was to the right uh, on the in the window seat. So far, the flight was normal. At cruising altitude, Sturkey remembers clear blue skies. But soon, the sky was replaced with darkness. It was almost pitch black dark. We had flown into the middle of a, a very dark gray, almost black thundercloud. The first thing I noticed um, that gave me an indication something might be wrong was I could tell that the plane dipped. You know, I equate it to being on a roller coaster. The pilots were flying into a thunderstorm. Windshield alert, northeast bound, you land at 190 at 13. 1016 is on the go. This is 1016, I'm staying on the go so far, then we head and climb and maintain 3,000. Up to three, we're taking a right turn now. You said 1016, I understand you're turning right. You said 1016, when you have time, tell me you're heading. You said 1016, shall I tell her? At 643, the plane made impact. I remember starting to think, you know, what's going on, but before I could process anything, um, there was one heavy jolt that threw me forward and backwards. And then within another split second, there was a, a much larger extreme, you know, most violent jolt that you can imagine that threw me forward again. You know, I now know that's when the plane had struck the ground. It was not a nosedive, it was a belly flop. I, I didn't hear anyone scream, oh no, we're going to crash. I, I could hear the engines revving up right after the drop and right before the first jolt the engine started winding up. The National Transportation Safety Board said a strong downward wind called a microburst slammed the DC-9 jet into the ground just west of the runway at Charlotte Douglas. The plane bounced, skidded into trees, then split into three parts. And that second jolt, it kind of just launched me, um, kind of like being shot out of a cannon because I couldn't see here. Well, I mean, I could see and hear. Um, if I could open my eyes, I could hear a lot. The sound was horrific. It was just a lot of crunching, crashing sounds. As you can imagine, when all of the chaos came to a stop, I was lying flat on my back. So I'm surmising that that second jolt threw me from my seat. Even though I was buckled in, my, my pelvis was fractured on the left side right where the buckle was, and I had a square indention um, in my pelvis. I initially thought we, we had exploded in midair and I was just flying through the air. Um, unable to open my eyes. But then after about 10 seconds, I'd say between five and 10 seconds of, of that feeling, um, everything came to a stop 
and I opened my eyes and I realized we were on the ground. Part of the jet landed on a house. The homeowners were on a rare trip out of town. Sturkey laid trapped in debris. Where I was located was inside the rear of the fuselage near the tail section that had crashed into the house and what I saw was the, the overhead of the airplane and wh where it met the structure of the house. My right arm was outstretched behind me um, and to the right and I was lying flat on my back and I couldn't even see my hand. My arm just disappeared in a pile of debris and I couldn't pull it down because there was debris underneath my right elbow. And my left arm was sandwiched right here to my chest. I couldn't hardly breathe. I mean, I, I now know I had collapsed lungs and that was why I couldn't breathe. I, I remember the smell of jet fuel. I, I was soaked in jet fuel. I remember the sound of the, the engines in the back, at least one of them very close to me was still going. I could feel intense heat coming from that direction. And I could hear fire crackling. Moments later, a policeman arrived. I wasn't sure if he had located me or not, but all I heard was the words, is there anybody in there? And since I couldn't speak, with collapsed lungs, you can't talk. Um, but I could groan and moan. As soon as I did that, he said the words, I think I hear you in there, I'm going to get help. He was there before any fire, any, any fire departments were there. He, was, he actually drove up on the scene first. He was just driving down the road and happened upon it. Um, and he's the one who told me when he first called it in, they didn't believe him. Um, he had to um, get pretty emphatic with them that it was what he was saying it was. They thought it was a joke at first. As the skies cleared, emergency crews surrounded the scene, pulling any survivors from the fiery wreckage. Other passengers in the section of the jet that landed on the house were able to run from the site. Sue and five-year-old Christopher did not survive. Within those first couple of minutes, when I actually processed, when I was processing what had just happened, I, I knew in my spirit that if what happened to me had just happened to them, they did not survive. Sturkey recalls being the last pulled to safety, thanks to the persistence of two Charlotte firefighters. First firefighter, I, I could hear them and I, they could talk to me, but I couldn't see them because there was a wall of debris behind, between them and I. On two different occasions, I heard someone who seemed to be an authority yell out, everybody out, I think it's gonna blow. And the first time it happened, all I heard was the pitter patter of feet running away and everything just became deathly silent. When they returned after that first time, I don't know who he was, but one of the firefighters said to me, because I couldn't see his face, I could just hear him through the debris. He told me, he called me by name, he said, Jason, he said, I'm not gonna leave you ever again until you're out of here. He said, I'm not leaving until you're out. Being soaked in jet fuel, I thought it was gonna explode at any minute. But luckily, by the grace of God, it did not. After firefighters worked to free Sturkey from the debris, he was airlifted to the hospital. As soon as he hit the operating table, he says, he went into cardiac arrest. I credit being here today to those those firefighters who worked tirelessly to, to get me there when they did because even 30 seconds later, if that, if that had happened and I had not been on the operating table, they wouldn't have had the tools to, to revive me. And I give God all the glory for that because that was, that was divine timing. He would be on life support for three days. My brother and my dad were, you know, were in the trauma unit to see me sometime around 1.30 a.m. And I remember opening my eyes and seeing them and just the look on their faces, I, I knew that my mom and Christopher did not survive. My family stayed, uh, apparently stayed in their seats. Um, and if I had stayed, in, if, if I had not uh, became separated from my seat, I would have most likely suffered the same fate. As we were cruising at altitude before we knew anything was wrong, we were just up above the clouds. Christopher, at five years old, we were up above the clouds looking down at a layer of clouds. And he looked over at me and said, Uncle Jason, he said, um, is, isn't this where Jesus lives? Meaning up above, because you always say he lives in the clouds in heaven. And I said, yes, Christopher, this is where Jesus lives. And the next words out of his mouth were, why can't I see Jesus? Sturkey made a full recovery. 25 years. In the years following the crash, he visited the firefighters who helped save his life, but says none of them took credit for never leaving his side. Five years and he also met with survivors for a few years. Something on this magnitude, you, you, it, it's always on your mind. You never forget it. Um, it doesn't mean you live trapped by it. It doesn't enslave you, but it is always there. It's the default setting in my brain. Whenever I'm 
whenever my mind goes idle, um, whenever I'm switching gears from one thing to the next, that is where it goes. It goes to the actual crash. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I'm not consumed by it. I don't let it dictate my life. These past 25 years have become a new normal for Sturkey and his family. He is one of 20 to survive. 37 died in the crash. There's so many, so many awesome people that would be impacting the Midlands in a, in a great way if they had not been lost that day. If anything, going forward, I would like to be that. I would like that to be what people remember is, is the people who lost loved ones. A federal investigation blamed the crash on several factors, including the lack of radar to alert the flight crew that they were entering what they later learned was a microburst complete with a lot of rain and wind. The plane crash happened after officials say the crew executed a missed landing in the middle of the storm. In the years after, a federal jury found the U.S. Air crew negligent. The company reportedly settled with families. The federal government also mandated traffic-controlled towers be equipped with the latest Doppler radar weather technology.